Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is John Moncrief. I'm the Education and Training Manager here at SideFX. And, and today I have with me Deb Isaacs. Uh, maybe you can tell me just a little bit about yourself, Deb. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm so honored to be here. My name's Deborah Isaac, and I'm the founder of Houdini School, which we just launched like two and a half months ago. Um, I'm also a adjunct professor at Drexel University. Awesome, awesome, that's fantastic. And and so Houdini School is an online-based uh, school, correct? Correct, it's 100% online. Although, you know, I do have ideas for creating kind of like pop-up, you know, boot camps and things like that. I mean, I do fantasize about having a Houdini retreat one day, but yeah, uh, currently, it is 100% online and it reaches a global audience. That's awesome, that's awesome. Uh, one of the themes that we have in this year's uh, Hive is we're trying to discuss um, studios and education and so schools that are developing skills and studios that need skills um, and just the overall connection between studios and schools in the visual effects and gaming industry. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the things that uh, I'm really curious to to kind of talk about is what has your been what has been your experience like teaching online through uh, COVID as opposed to just a regular online school. Uh, it, it's different when you teach for a university as a remote professor, but then when you have a dedicated online learning situation, it's a, it's a different thing. So I'm just wondering if maybe you actually, could tell us yeah. About that. That's interesting because I was teaching online on Zoom for years before uh, COVID even happened at Drexel. I'm in Los Angeles and Drexel's in Philadelphia. So I got into the whole um, Zoom um, um, right before, you know, a couple of years before COVID. And one of the thing about that was they were all in the same lab. They were in their computer lab at school and they had all the same computers and, and um, tech where when COVID hit, all those students had to go home and now they all had completely different hardware. So that was kind of tricky. Um, they also didn't have two monitors. And I think we're going to get into that about how technology plays into this. But um, that was also a disadvantage to, to not have two monitors while learning on Zoom. Yeah, uh, we've experienced that too when we've done uh, training at studios or for studios that are using Houdini and they request us to, you know, come in and provide them with some assistance and training. Um, and since I've done it because, again, I'm a, I'm a remote employee, uh, I, I live and work in Oklahoma. And so I'm oftentimes presenting and teaching at places and it's always through a Zoom or a Teams or something like that. Uh, but I was like you, I was used to people being in a training room or or something where they had like right. a nice hardware with multiple monitors and things. Um, and the second that COVID hit and we still continued to do training, the biggest right. problem was we, we heard from people was uh, like something simple. Um, everyone lay down a sphere. So tab type SPH and get your sphere. And then yeah. it's a, so now everybody lay down a color node. And then you say, who has a red ball? Does everybody have a red ball? Are we all on the same page? And like, no, nobody was on the same because they were trying to watch you on the screen do it. Then full screen Houdini would come up and they would try to do the thing and then switch back to the full screen Zoom to see yeah. what you did and then to their own full screen Houdini. And they couldn't see both. Like it wasn't like a lecture. It was more of like a, I don't know, a racing like hurdles race or something. It was just, it was crazy. There was no way to to really know where the school or where the school, where the students or the learners were. Like that was right. Really different. You know, that completely works for a lecture style class where the students are obviously they're just watching you. But if they're um, following along, they definitely need. I mean, it's a huge advantage to have that extra monitor. But also, um, you know, if you can borrow someone's laptop or um, get an iPad or anything like that also uh would help i also wonder if a television could also be <laughs> rigged yeah. to be your second monitor you know just to see what the teacher is doing so you know i i just hope that people can get a little creative with what they've got on hand yeah yeah well and that's um i mean that's from you and i coming from a training teaching perspective that's us presenting ourselves to the to the class 
But there's also the opposite side of that when you're when you're training somebody or teaching someone, which is you want to see them, not just their work, yeah. but like their faces. Oh, like totally. when you can see when somebody, you know, gets an idea or if they're totally frustrated and you don't have that two way street uh, through traditional online learning methods. Like how That's did you right. deal with, with that? So that's also really interesting. Um, you know, I rely on facial expressions and body language a lot. And um, especially in person, of course, it's completely obvious, you know, it's right in front of you, easy to see. Um, but in Zoom, you can also see faces and it's, you know, it can be a little weird with Zoom and the way that you see those galleries of faces and you know, it snaps to the right, it snaps to the left. And, yeah. you know, do you want it on the horizontal top or do you want it, you know, so in, a, you know, Zoom, I'm even after a year still kind of getting used to it. <laughs> but um, it's hugely important to have, if you can, those faces in front of you, um, just to see those expressions, because sometimes students they they feel shy or they don't want to ask questions because they don't want to reveal what they don't know and so yeah. i rely heavily on facial expressions to tell me if someone gets it and um uh you know things like frowns or just complete you know stillness <laughs> to me <laughs> are signs that they might not be getting it and then things like you know i'll get a smile or i get a nod or things like that. Or I'll be like, do you get it, everybody? <laughs> I will, you know, <laughs> <All right. laughs> try to get them to really say it. Um, so, and, and also I'll explain things in different ways. Like I'll explain the same thing perhaps in like two different ways or three different ways, because it could be that third way you explain it that clicks because sometimes just using the right word or using the right analogy um clicks for them yeah. and then you see maybe a face light up yeah that's i i totally agree with you that that um <laughs> i explain all of these houdini things in ways that like relate to real life somehow like when i was trying to explain how particles yeah. pass attributes <laughs> back and forth to each other and i always telling the story about these boy scouts that go camping and as they're camping they pass another their troop and they look in each other's backpacks to see what information is in their backpacks and that's like particles passing data back and forth and all kinds of whatever. It's so silly, <laughs> but like I've had so many people come up to me after those kinds of things and say like, I get that made perfect sense to me. Like, I know it seems so stupid yeah. and it was like a dumb little dad joke way of presenting it, but <laughs> for some people that clicks and that's what makes sense. You know, not everybody is like super mathy, you know? Right. Um, that it, yeah, I mean, attributes is probably one of the harder things to explain to students and, um, you know, I like to explain it a certain way, but I think I'm going to, that inspires me. I'm, I'm going to think I'm going to like find some new analogies to, <laughs> to uh, teach attributes. It's one of the hardest and most fundamental things to understand as a student. Um, but yeah, analogies are great. Yeah, but I'm, I'm with you 100% on how do you know if it worked or not? And it's seeing people's reactions to it. I mean, know if somebody got it or not it's what i call it the light bulb moment right where you yes. see the go off over someone's head right and that's uh i miss that so much i miss <laughs> that so much um yeah it's interesting um one of the things that uh i know we had kind of talked about a little bit um uh, when we first were initially wanting to, to have this discussion was uh, an idea of like step-by-step -step tutorials yes. versus like the Socratic method versus just different teaching methodologies, different ways of right. um, getting the students to interact with not just the software, but with the concepts and the thoughts. And so I was just wondering if you could maybe um, explain a little bit about how those methods yeah. work for you specifically, again, online and in this limited uh, I don't know what you expanded, but limited world of teaching right. through this screen, right? Yeah, and and that really interests me. These different ways of teaching and learning, and at at uh, Houdini School, um, I really encourage teachers to teach in their styles, what feels comfortable for them, um, and because I believe that you know every teacher has some kind of knowledge to share, and they're going to deliver it in different ways. 
And same with students. Students learn in different ways too. And I think it's important for students to learn from as many teachers as possible. And also live also has an advantage as well because you can actually talk to them. Um, but regarding all those different styles, um, there's, there's pros and cons to each one. They're all valid. Um, Hands-on, step-by-step, which is my style, um, has the advantage of pure engagement. They're actually actively learning as you're teaching and you're guiding them step by step. Um, and so, so I really like that one. And, and um, that's how I learned for the very first time. Lecture, as you know, is just pure information. The student will, um, student can just be, you know, passively listening, taking notes, or, or hopefully following a little bit along if they can. Hopefully they might even have the file open. So while the teacher yeah. is explaining things, that they can actually investigate the file as, as the teacher's going through things. Um, and the advantage to that is that the teacher can convey more information. You can always explain more things if you don't have to stop and help the student. By the way, another advantage to Zoom is you can actually take over a student's machine online without getting up, you know, out of your chair <laughs> to go over, yeah, which, you know, know was still fun. You that. know, that's fantastic. Like, yeah. I'm going to definitely do that next time I'm doing yeah. a class. I'm just going to like grab somebody like, no, 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 let me show you how, how this works. <laughs> That's and awesome. people, yeah, and you know, people can even annotate on each other's screens, you know, while I'm sharing my screen, I've had some, you know, some students kind of like, uh, do some pranks where they, they draw on my screen while I'm teaching, <laughs> which nice. is, it's fun. I like it. Um, some other ways of teaching are um, the Socrates method, which we had uh, Jeff Matthew, Matthew Phillips taught a VEX class this way, which was super was so engaging because what he would do is in, instead of show the, the students how to do it, first he would ask them, how do I do this? And then the students would try to figure it out. And if they didn't know how to do it, he would go forward. But let's say one student had um, an idea, then another student would then you know, it, it would percolate everyone, you know, and then one student would, they would riff off of each other. Then yeah. another student would get an idea and then another student would get an idea. And it just became this crescendo of, of learning. Um, and that was really, really an exciting way to learn and super interactive and super engaging. Um, and so that's another way to do it. Um, I'm trying to think, I think there's one more uh, oh, lab, you know, you could just have your standard lab session where students are just plugging away and, and they're, you know, and they get stuck and you come around and you help them figure it out. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can mix them up too. You can do a lecture and then you can do a lab. Um, so, you know, and then there's homework and, and things like that. So there's, there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot to it, a lot of options. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I just think it's it's uh, been a really interesting, I guess, two years now, year and whatever it is that we're into this uh, this thing where, uh, <laughs> again, you and I have sort of had the experience of, of these challenges before uh, it yeah. was COVID. But now that everybody is in is in the remote work space and having to do things in remote, it's like right. uh, the problems that you and I may have experienced either on the teaching or learning side because we were remote. It's like now all of a sudden everybody's experiencing these things. And so we're all trying to find a solution for some of these problems instead of just the few of us that are the outliers. Like everybody became the outlier at one point. Right. 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 Yeah. So I think that's been super, super interesting to watch uh, how things have developed that. And uh, I think it's earlier we were talking about zoom. Uh, yeah. I, I work at a, a company full of extremely bright people that all know how to do very, very complicated things <laughs> with software, but right. I don't think any of us have, have managed to get zoom down yet. Right. So, <laughs> So where does the bar go? Is it the top or the bottom? Yeah. Am I covering the interface and Easy how do things I turn on the hard. record? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like we can do Houdini, but don't throw Zoom at me. It's too much. <laughs> right, right. It's way too much. Um, so um, I know one of the other things that we had talked about earlier, too, was the fact that how being online uh, we, we, I mean, so far we've talked about like the restrictions and things that we've had to hurdles we've had to come over to be able to teach effectively online. 
Um, mm-hmm. But we also talked a little bit, and I'd like to continue to have a conversation about how being online has been helpful. I mean, some of the positive things that have come out of this experience of teaching sure. and learning online. Sure. I mean, it's accessibility is is probably the biggest one, right? Um, sure. The fact that sure. you can have such a huge reach um, that you don't have to travel. And um, one of the other things I was thinking about, too, is um, the fact that when you record a Zoom session, it's it's the exact class that you took where and right. then you could see it later. Right. But in a live class, it, it, you cannot record it in the same way, obviously. Right. Because there's um, the teachers walking around. There could be a blackboard. The, the audio would be all over the place. Right. Um, so that's a huge advantage is the, the fact that the, the class and the recording are one in the same. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes for repeatability, which is, again, I, we talked about how different people learn different ways. Um, yeah. For me, like I, I always try to, if I'm taking a course or watching a tutorial or doing anything like that, I'm always hands off. Like I, even if they want you to be hands on, I'm more wanting to take in what's happening and take notes on what they're doing and pay attention to what they're doing. Then I'll go back and do it again sure. and I'll, I'll watch it and do the steps and I'll be like, oh yeah, I know where we're going with this. And now I understand why this has happened. And But that's you can't do, like you said, you can't do that in a real classroom. That has to be a product of a recording. Uh, and then yeah, going back and right. watching the recording, right? Right, right. And one more thing I wanted to say about the the watching before doing is you know as for a teacher i think um it's still important to kind of like pause and ask questions and you know because sometimes you know students fall asleep <laughs> yeah. and, hey, and, uh, let me put it, professionals fall asleep as well <laughs> it's not just students <laughs> and the professionals you know the the um the tricky thing is I have students, you know, at a university, so I can say, hey, everyone, turn on your webcam. But at a studio, if you're doing studio training, you can't tell people, hey, everyone, turn on your webcams. You know, those professionals, they could be working at the same time yeah. that they're listening to you. They could and, and you know, they could be tired. They work long hours. Um, so it's a different thing, actually, to teach studio professionals than to teach students. Um, especially when the studio has asked for them to learn for it or the studio has paid for them to do it. Um, right. And I'm lucky, you know, at Houdini school, they decide to take the class. So they're really um, engaged when, when we see them, which is wonderful. Um, but yeah, it is different teaching studio professionals, which is what you do most of the time right now, John. Yeah, the majority of the time, that's that's where our team has been involved. Especially this last half of this year, it's been it's been that very pretty heavily. Yeah, um, and when we do presentations at at schools and universities, our presentations are more presentations. They're not we're not teaching for yeah. the day. It's what the right. instructors are there for, what the professors are there for, right? So right. we might do um, here's some new workflows you might not have thought of to solve this problem, or if the professor has had questions from students. They might yeah. elevate them, so we just go and present a solution to some of those questions. But the actual training, like the, the curriculum development and delivery to people that are trying to learn, yes, the majority of that has been yeah studio based um, studio based training. And that's a real challenge too, because I think we were talking about this. The studios want to cram in as many uh, artists as they possibly can, and that that's problematic. I would never recommend more than twenty people. <laughs> On, yeah, on one say, Zoom what is your call? average size class or the biggest class you've had? Yeah. I mean, I have 17 now and it's fine. You know, I, I'm at this point, I, it's fine. Um, but I really don't think it should go beyond around 20. Um, I, I think, uh, it's, it, this, that's even easier for the studio artists to completely check out. Um, and it feels impersonal. How do you how do how do you develop that teacher student connection with all those students? I mean, in a traditional university, you know, when when you know I was an undergrad, yeah, we'd have these big lecture halls, you know, for like you know the humanities classes, right? And then right. you'd have the teaching assistant. You go into like breakout rooms, right? And then those would be small. So at least they had that. 
and and maybe that could be the solution where you know you replicate that kind of system where you as the main lecturer do, you do your big thing and then you've got like your interns that <laughs> yeah, yeah. are in the breakout rooms you know and you do that and then, and then we'll know who is paying attention yeah exactly exactly <laughs> uh, i've had i had some pretty interesting experiences over the years where where uh, for one reason or another, someone might check out for, you know, whether they were not paying attention for one reason or whatever. And then as soon as you stop and say, are there any questions, that seems to always be the person that, hey, how did you get the blah, blah, blah yeah. to work on the thing? <laughs> and, you know, if you're a, if you're a, a I, I would say if I was like a college professor and there was a, a younger learner that was checking out often, I, I could maybe be a little more, um, you know, well, maybe if you'd pay attention, you'd understand. Yeah. <laughs> I would never do that in a professional setting. That would just not be appropriate, you know? Right, right, right. It's interesting. It's interesting the different types of audiences. Um, but I imagine that you get that from semester to semester even. Like you have different groups of people that are different different sections of teaching where you have different groups of people. One time you teach it, it's going to be completely different than the next time that you teach it because sure. you've got different skill levels and different levels of personalities that you're dealing with as well. It's so. always different and it's always different skill levels. And it's, it's in, and for also what I teach is it's completely different too. I try to gauge the students in the beginning. Um, I try to tailor it to them, but also, you know, I, I think about what I want to teach that I think they should know as well. Um, it is, it is a little, um challenging i'd say at, at the university i teach at because uh houdini is an elective and yeah. it, it might be and it's only one class and they're not allowed to take it until they've already had a year or two of required other cg classes and that just brings a host of challenges uh learning houdini in that environment sure sure yeah i hadn't even really thought about that mm -hmm. um, that's interesting. I think it's interesting how we were when we we're talking about studio or like professional training versus student based yeah. right. training where you're talking about the money piece of it. And yeah. I, I always remember when I was in undergrad, and many won't tell you how many years ago, uh, my first time out of <laughs> high school undergrad uh, and I would sleep through classes and I didn't really care too much. But it's because I had my parents helping me. Right. Yeah. Um, when I went to graduate school and I was learning Houdini for the first time, I was very yeah. much like. Uh, can I stay extra? Can I be here an extra right. 30 minutes? Can I can right. I spend more of your time? Can I pick your brain right. more about this? And it was like, because yeah. I knew what that was costing me, right? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Maybe maybe we, we make uh, make the individual professional learners pay for the <laughs> stuff. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah. No, but that's interesting. You, the level of skin in the game that you have for the level of knowledge that you're wanting to get back is, is just interesting as to how that affects your ability to learn. And also, if there's a student for every drexel class i teach there's you know one or two students where it changes their life i mean and they they just yeah. you know they're learning it and they're like whoa my entire career is gonna go in this completely other direction and yeah. and i call it the houdini bug <laughs> oh that's <laughs> um, nice they've yeah. caught the houdini bug you know and and yeah they even though their education might be paid for um they're still doing what you did where they're they're just bugging me all the time wanting to learn this and that and asking questions so i that's really re rewarding when that happens yeah i uh i don't know if it would have happened for me online come to think of it that's really interesting i i was in school and i was walking i wanted to be an animator so bad that was yeah. my ultimate job i wanted to be an animator right so <laughs> i was on my way to one of my, my animation classes and i happened to walk by a classroom and I looked up on the projector screen and it was a boat and there uh -huh. was a boat that was in this big, awesome ocean. And there was basically, I didn't realize what was happening, but it was, a, it was a Houdini <laughs> class and they were showing like all the ocean tools and how to develop all these. And I actually stood like in the doorway and watched that class and yeah. didn't go to mine. And the professor right. came out and asked me, he was like, are you enrolled in this course? And yeah. I was like, no, but I will be. Like, I think I need to be because that was <laughs> And that's, yeah. where, that's, where, that's where the Houdini bug got me. Yeah. Right. I, I remember when I was doing in person, uh, you know, before, and I, I would see those people in the doorway. I remember that. <laughs> there is one thing I wanted to bring up. If any schools and universities are watching that don't have Houdini offered at their school, 
um, the students really want it or they don't know um, that it exists or they might have heard things about it and maybe they don't have the right impression of it. But I encourage every school or university to at least have one class because I think it's important for students to at least be exposed to it, especially if you're an animation school or an art school. I think it, it students really need to know that at least this is an, a possibility for them to learn Houdini. And a lot of times it takes a champion at that yeah. school to go out and, and reach out to you, John, or to um, figure out a way either to get a teacher or to maybe learn on their own or ask another teacher to learn or start a club or, or something just for, um, I think it'd be, it's just wonderful for students. I never had that at my school for a grad or undergrad. And um, I did learn outside and just looking back, I just think uh, that would have been really nice. And I just, um, applaud um, all the champions out there that have tried to get Houdini into their schools. Yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, you're hundred percent right. And it's, it's interesting because that's also the the case at some studios where there'll be one or two people that are super yeah. interested in what this, you know, technology can do. Right. Uh, and they become the the champion, like you said, the advocate, the sort of grassroots. The advocate. To get it right. Going. And I know it's hard. Everyone's so busy. I get that. But, it, but the reward is high and people who learn together they become friends with each other and you know maybe even start a hug you know a, a user group or there's so many ways to learn um and my um philosophy uh, i'm a big community person i run the houdini battles i run la hug i co-organize la hug and you know starting houdini school it's, it's a huge uh part of it is community uh, so I really think, you know, even if there's not a school offered, the school, the students can band together um, and there's still a lot possible. Yeah, that's uh, it's interesting what you say about people that learn together, you know, grow together, become friends yeah. and, and that kind of thing. Um, I was a, myself a side effects intern many, many years ago. And that group of people, I still see them to this day and we still stay in touch and we talk because we went through learning this this software together and it was we were all very very into it and it was a great yeah. shared experience and it's affected our lives and it's been great so it's bonding um, absolutely yeah yeah for sure well Deb, thank you so much for being here today this is awesome i really appreciate <laughs> everything you've got going and i'm so excited for you with houdini school oh thank you so much and uh thank you so much for having me this is really fun john yeah we'll do it again yep sounds good <laughs>